at the Karolinska Institute, I wish to convey to you our warmest congratulations, and I now ask you to step forward to receive the Nobel Prize from the hand of His Majesty the King. Hello, I'm Sam Stanley, President of Stony Brook University. It is my honor and pleasure to pay tribute to one of the brightest of Stony Brook's shining stars, Dr. Paul C. Lauterbur. It was 40 years ago, right here in this chemistry department, that Dr. Lauterbur conducted the landmark research that led to the development of magnetic resonance imaging, a technique that has revolutionized healthcare saved millions of lives, and improved the quality of life for tens of millions more. It was for that research that Dr. Lauterbur was awarded the 2003 Nobel Prize in Medicine. Today, more than 60 million MRI scans are performed worldwide every year. As a physician, I have firsthand experience of the vital role that Dr. Lauterbur's groundbreaking discovery plays in the day-to-day -day practice of medicine and the tremendous impact it has on medical research. All of us here at Stony Brook University are extremely proud of Dr. Lauterbur and his contribution to science and humanity. The designation of our chemistry department as a National Historic Chemical Landmark by the American Chemical Society is a wonderful tribute to this great man and an honor to our university. carefully building a research faculty and one of our priorities from the beginning days was to find an expert in nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy. So I was very pleased when the possibility of Paul Lauterbur's candidacy for the, an appointment in our department became a possibility. Paul Lauterbur's credentials were unusual to say the least because he had been working full-time at the Maryland Institute and going to graduate school on the site at the University of Pittsburgh. And he, so he was a, apparently, in the record, a fresh PhD. So I was pleased to be, that we were able to, to arrange an associate professorship position for him and delighted when, in the fall of 1962, he agreed to come and join us in Stony Brook. I uh, came to Stony Brook in the fall of 1967. Uh, as a freshman, I knew I was going to become a chemist, and I took freshman chemistry from Paul Lauterbur. He was teaching the course that year. And sometime during my sophomore year, one of his grad students came to me and said, want to work in a lab? And I said, sure. I had no idea what I was getting myself into, but it turned out to be Paul Lauterbur's lab. Well, I eventually learned that uh, this is an NMR spectrometer, and it's a very early version of what today has become a much more complex piece of instrumentation, but it's one of the central pieces of equipment uh, that's used for analytical chemistry, for analyzing molecules, uh, determining structures of proteins, and so forth. So the main component here is a magnet. So inside here, there's a permanent magnet. Uh, 
for chemical samples, you put the sample in this glass tube called an NMR tube. Classical cat. Um, it would go into the spectrometer like this. So now the sample is between the poles of the magnet. You close it up, and then the instrument takes data. And in those days, the way data was recorded was with a pen recorder, which probably no longer works, but there would have been an ink pen on this gadget, and this mechanical device would scan across the paper, and in fact, you can still see um, the trace of an NMR spectrum here. So the spectrum would be slowly swept out. And that's the way NMR was done in 1967. The key in this instrument where we turn NMR spectroscopy into MR imaging is right in here. Paul realized is that if you take one of the magnetic field adjustments, and I'm guessing it was probably this one, if you set it way out of whack, turn it all the way up, you then have a magnetic field that changes from one side of the sample to another. It messes up your NMR spectra, but what Paul realized is it now gives you a projection of the object. It's the same instrumentation that eventually was used to produce the first MRI scans. And Paul did that, in fact, on this particular machine. Some people may wonder why Paul Lauderer used an A60 magnetic resonance instrument for his experiments that first demonstrated uh, magnetic resonance imaging. Forty years ago, electronic circuits were mostly based on vacuum tube technology, which was uh, produced, uh, the more sophisticated the instrument, the more maintenance was required. It was a very high maintenance uh, situation. And equipment maintenance was not high on his priority list. And so the equipment in his own laboratories was often in strong need of maintenance, if not outright inoperative. So he hit upon the idea, he was so excited to try to demonstrate experimentally these principles for making pictures from magnetic resonance signals, that he hit upon the idea of using the departmental A60 uh, magnetic resonance instrument. Now the A60 instrument was of such a physical size that it could only take samples that could fit within a five millimeter test tube like this. Now he realized at the time he was doing these experiments already that in principle he should be able to do this uh, from the water in tissue inside a living organism. And so Paul took it back to the lab and put the clam in the five millimeter tube and then filled it with heavy water outside of the clam and proceeded to make uh, an image, the first image of a living organism. We're very fortunate here at Oregon Health and Science University in the Advanced Imaging Center to have behind me, over my shoulder, a, a cutting edge human uh, MRI instrument. magnets with these properties would never have been built if Paul Lauderbur or someone after him did not discover how to make pictures from magnetic resonance signals. Welcome to the PET Imaging Laboratory at Brookhaven National Laboratory. Behind me is a positron emission tomograph scanner. It's more commonly referred to as a PET scanner. Let me start out by saying that PET and MRI are highly complementary. What many people don't realize, however, is that PET scans don't begin with the PET scanner, they begin with chemistry. Chemists synthesize labeled compounds, also called radio tracers, to image chemistry that is occurring in the brain and in other organs. Let me give you an example. 
We're now making new radio tracers and using PET and also our MRI scanner across the street to answer questions like, what are the brain circuits that get disrupted when people get addicted to drugs or alcohol, or when they have an eating disorder like obesity? In terms of technology, PET instruments and PET chemistry are getting better and better. Resolution is getting higher and sensitivity is improving. And there are many lessons that Paul Lauterberg's story can teach us. First and foremost is the importance of institutions where creative individuals have the freedom to pursue ideas that are not in the mainstream. Universities in general, and the chemistry department at Stony Brook in particular, provided that freedom to Paul Lauterberg, and his discovery changed the world. Professor Lauterberg and Professor Mansfield. Your discoveries of imaging with magnetic resonance have played a seminal role in the development of one of the most useful imaging modality in medicine today. All indications are that they will be even more important in the future of both medical practice and research and above all for the patient. On behalf of the Nobel Assembly at the Karolinska Institute, I wish to convey to you our warmest congratulations, and I now ask you to step forward to receive the Nobel Prize from the hand of His Majesty the King. Stony Brook Chemistry has a long tradition of interdisciplinary research. The best example is the work of Professor Paul Lauterberg, who combined the principles of biology, chemistry, and physics for his Nobel Prize winning discovery. We're living in exciting times with many breakthroughs in technology. However, mankind is also facing some of its greatest challenges. Looking ahead, chemistry will play an essential role in dealing with many of these challenges. On behalf of the department, I thank you for watching this video.